We're going to cover a lot of ground here. So uh, what are the decision tools we have to determine about biopsy and rebiopsy patients with elevated PSA? I have no disclosures with this talk. Um, so straight to the point, when we're trying, starting to screen patients, uh, we're basically going from the basics. We have history and physical. The rectal exams are still very important. And we need to assess comorbid conditions so we can assess life expectancy. We have a good estimation so we can discuss individual risks and the goals of therapy. And PSA plays an important role in all of this. Of course, uh, PSA is not a simple uh, biomarker when you have a positive or negative. Still, a lot of people manage that way and they see elevated PSA, automatically it goes towards biopsy and towards treatment. You all familiarize with overdiagnosis issues, over treatment issues, all the controversy around it. And uh, that's because the biomarker is very sensitive, but it's not specific for cancer. It's specific for prostate, but not for cancer. And that leads to a lot of a false positive. So how can we mitigate and uh, individualize risks and try to personalize assessment and all of this. So going back to the basics, uh, there's a lot of uh, PSA derivatives that we can use and uh, there seem to be a little bit forgotten these days. So uh, we talk about a cutoff. Um, at some point, it was even a proposition for the, the, the cutoff to be dropped to 2.5 to increase specificity of the test. Uh, we use percent free of PSA, you all know, less than 10% is suggestive of benign histology, greater than 25% is suggestive of a, of a malignancy. Uh, the other way around, I'm sorry, less than 10% malignancy, greater than 25% benign uh, uh, um, histology. Uh, we use age-adjusted tables so we can control for the, for the variations between range and age. So we go by these limits when you're talking about patients. And also we use a lot of the baseline assessment. We have a lot of information showing that patients with a PSA below one and a half or one, a baseline uh, uh, drawn at 45 or 50 years of age is prognostic and it can inform the risk of uh, cancer over life. Um, PSA density, very, very useful. Um, 0 0.5 is the cutoff used. Velocity and uh, all the PSA kinetics uh, are very uh, useful as well. So if you have a PSA less than 4, uh, the cutoff is usually 0 0.35. For PSAs between 4 and 10, the cutoff goes to 0 0.75. And of course, we assess the risk factors. The most well-known risk factors are age, the family history, uh, race, and uh, in terms of family history, the importance of prostate and breast cancer in the family and the association with the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. We're gonna go into genetic testing at the end of this talk. Just make a quick pause um, in this. Again, very important to use these tools. A lot of people these days is jumping into the biomarkers, jumping to MRI at the first alter an abnormal PSA, and then, you know, we have a pyrets three or four on MRI, and they say, well, we need a biopsy, and they never even stop to think that the patient has like a 100 grams of prostate, and the PSA of five or six is not even that off for that size of a prostate. So we have to go back and reassess and do all these steps before we jump into these this new markers. Uh, there's parting tables, nomograms, risk calculators, and this is just a small sample of uh, hundreds of tools that is out there that we can use. Um, but now we have all this new menu of a lot of uh, interesting things that we, can, that we can use. So MRI with the PIRATS classification has roles in terms of screening, biomarker, uh, localizer, and it can combine with biopsy for targeting and, uh, and even focal therapy. The molecular test can be done on blood, urine, and tissue. We have genetic tests that we can use, and uh, mostly in blood for this space, for this indication, and also new pet agents for accurate staging, which is not the focus of this talk. So uh, in the blood, what we have available commercially and the most, most popularly, we have the PHI, the PHI, Prostate Health Index. We have 4K, genetic testing for germline mutations. We're gonna talk about that too. And uh, in the urine, we have the PCA3, which is done after prostatic massage. We have SelectMDX, also requires a prostatic expression, prostatic massage. The EPI, the ExoDX IntelliScore, this one is just for a simple uh, urine sample. Um, in the tissue, we can use the Confirm MDX, which is uh, uh, performed on the previous biopsy sample. And, uh, and also the P10 and ERG, those tests also can be done on the pathology uh, from the biopsy sample. And uh, we're gonna talk also about imaging base and MRI, and how this MRI has changed the game completely. So I don't have to convince you all how important MRI has become in, 
in terms of the management of this disease. Now we can see and localize these tumors, very obvious there. And even in areas that are uh, not so accessible through the regular sampling biopsy in transition zone, anterior glands, now we can see and we can target those lesions very, very uh, precisely. Um, just a quick comparison between the original version of the pyrads and the new version. So it is a lot better, uh, less role for uh, spectroscopy. The DCE seems to play also a, a, a minor role in this. And uh, we also talk about the dominant uh, series for each area of the process. So for example, um, going to this next table here, you can see for lesions on the peripheral zone, we usually use the, the, the DWI sequencing as the main dominant sequence to, to score these lesions. Uh, for lesions in the transition zone, on the other hand, we use the 2-2 weighted uh, sequencing to score these lesions using just the WI for a quick differentiation there. Quick word about fusion biopsy. Again, combining with the MRI, we can go and hit lesions that are completely far away from us. We would never sample that if we're not seeing, if we're not seeking to target those lesions. So this has been really, really important. This is just using Artemis, but there are other systems in the market. Let's talk about the markers now. So PHI. PHI is indicated for patients with PSA between 2 and 10. Uh, the score is calculated based on the, on the total PSA, the free PSA, and the PRO2 PSA, and then it gives you the likelihood of having a prostate biopsy on a subsequent, uh, prostate cancer on a subsequent biopsy. You can see this ROC curve, how the score outperforms the other, the PSA, the total PSA, the free PSA, and the percent free alone. And this table shows the, for, for the different ranges of the PHI scores, what's the probability of prostate cancer and the probability of having a Gleason score greater than seven. The 4K is also performed in the blood and uh, it has this name because it includes four catechrines. So it's total PSA, free PSA, the intact PSA, and HK2. And uh, the algorithm also includes some clinical variables like age, rectal examination, and the previous uh, biopsy results. Uh, the results are not only the probability of having cancer, but also uh, high-risk cancer, and also informs the risk of a metastatic disease in 20 years. The normal value is 7.5, and you can see here in these two graphics how uh, uh, the test is stratified, for example, patients with PSA greater than two, and having a positive versus a negative 4K score in terms of risk of prostate cancer mortality. And you see, the, you see the separation of the curves here too, this mortality curves, uh, in terms of distant metastasis in, two year, in 20 years for PSAs above three. So it's a really, really uh, uh, impressive uh, uh, prediction based on this blood test. This is just to uh, give you the reference of a validation. This is the um, Malmo series from the Sweden screening, and they had uh, uh, a lot of our blood uh, uh, frozen from that study, from the screening study, and they ran the 4K on that sample, large, large population, long-term follow-up, and they validated those results. So very interesting paper to, uh, to read it. PCA3, PCA3 is done in the urine, uh, is indicated for patients with a negative biopsy, but still persistent suspicion for, for cancer. Uh, the score is based on a quantified ratio between the PSA3 and the, and, uh, and the PSA, PCA3 and the PSA mRNA uh, uh, levels detected in the urine. Um, the, the normal value uh, is given as 25, but if you drop cut off to 21 or 18, you can get even more uh, uh, specific results. ROC curves showing the PCA3 how outperforms the other uh, uh, models, and here the risk of having uh, uh, positive biopsies according to the scoring. Next one I'm gonna cover is SelectMDX. SelectMDX is done also in the urine, also requires a prostatic massage, and they look into uh, two genes, uh, so it's also uh, mRNA-based, so DLX1 and a hoax C6. Um, they also combine in their algorithm some clinical variables listed here, and uh, they have a very, very high uh, negative predictive value for high risk, at least on eight prostate cancer, 95 negative predictive value for at least on seven prostate cancer. Uh, 
this is just a sample of their of their uh, report, and then you can see how they give the likelihood of a of a cancer and a cancer with a Gleason 7 or higher in that sample. This is a newer test. Uh, it's called EPI, the XODX. Um, is also performed um, in the urine, but this one does not require any prostatic massage or expression. Uh, they also have a kit that can be done at home. So you just send the order, patients can collect the urine at home, ship to the lab, and you get the results in a few days. Um, indicated for PSA is between two and 10, and uh, they look at the uh, exosome RNA, so it's a little bit different technique there. Uh, and the genes they interrogate here is the ERG and PCA3 and SPDEF. And they come up with this score uh, when you have the cutoff above 15.6, that's informative and suggestive of a, of a biopsy. You can see the ROC curves for the EPI in comparison with the PCPT calculator or using P total PSA alone in blue. Confirming the X. Confirming the X. Uh, is used um, when you have a previous negative biopsy. It's done on the tissue, and uh, they look for DNA methylation. Uh, three different genes that are very well known and uh, associated with uh, prostate cancer is uh, interrogated in every single core from your biopsy. And then it's enough that you have only one of those cores positive for methylation for the test to be positive. Um, it also takes into some clinical variables in the logistic regression. And uh, the area under the curve is okay, 76%, but they have approximately 90 negative predictive values. So it's an informative test, and uh, it gives you the report in the form of a map. So here in this table, you have every single core from your previous biopsy, and the three genes that are being interrogated. If you have a methylation there, it puts on a map, and, uh, and it gives you in the bar the likelihood of a, of a cancer and a repeat biopsy, and also the risk for detecting a Gleason score uh, at a lower risk, and also a uh, glycine score for seven and higher. What is interesting is because the methylation is an is a epigenetic uh, um, defect, we're interrogating a field effect. So if you know, when you biopsy, of course you have to biopsy the whole prostate, but you should concentrate and have additional cores in the areas where the test was positive and around it, because that's where likely the tumor is supposed to, to, to be localized. In this case study they have on their website, they show here the location where the test was positive and having a positive biopsy in all the areas surrounding that. The P10 and ERG, uh, this is also done in the tissue and indicated for patients who have high-grade pain and, uh, and atypia. So um, we all know P10, it's a very well-known tumor suppressor gene. Uh, the loss of expression of this gene is, is, is uh, uh, present in prostate cancer in up to 70% of the cases. And here you can see the biochemical recurrence for survival associated with the, 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 the presence of the loss of expression of a P10. Uh, when you look at the ERG, uh, this fusion gene is present in up to 80% of prostate cancer, very well-known as well, very well-described. And the, the, the methodology here is through FISH, so fluorescence inside to hybridization. So um, they mark the probes with different colors. You see where the ERG gene is located, where the tempers gene is located. When there's a fusion or there's any uh, um, uh, insertion that causes the, the fusion of those two genes, you have overexpression, and this is associated with a carcinogenesis for prostate cancer. So um, when you combine those two, we have the, the possible combinations here and the kepler meyer curves for biochemical recurrence for survival. This informs if that high-grade pain or the typical uh, uh, prostate needs to be rebiopsy immediately or later. Of course, we will always plan to rebiopsy at some point if they have these, these lesions, but if the test is positive, you might be discussing with the patient for immediate rebiopsy. How about genetic testing? So uh, germline testing is something that is becoming more and more uh, uh, um, um, popular and a very uh, common in these days, and especially in this disease. Uh, we are understanding more and more about the association of prostate cancer with hereditary cancer predisposition syndromes. The most common are the HBOC, and we all know about the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes and, uh, and the uh, ovarian and the breast cancer. Lynch syndrome recently has been very well described to be associated with prostate cancer as well and the mismatch repair genes listed here. So this is not only important for the patients that you're treating, but also screening prevention in their families. Uh, in 2019, there was a Philadelphia Prostate Cancer uh, Consensus Conference, and they're trying to standardize criteria for testing. So um, 
ignoring for this talk the metastatic and the no metastatic but uh, if your patient has a history of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry or family history uh, including brother, father, or two or more members in the family of a prostate cancer with an incidence younger than 60 years old or who had died of prostate cancer or had metastasis prostate cancer is an important risk factor. If they have other types of tumors, uh, it needs to be two or more cancers from the HBOC or the Lynch syndrome, especially if they have an incidence at a lower age younger than 50 years old. Um, there's a lot of a commercial tests, and I'm not even going to mention them, but uh, just to put here that what are the most uh, uh, commonly associated genes uh, that should be interrogated in your genetic testing. And uh, what are the implications is that men, even without diagnosis of prostate cancer, if they have this mutation, if you detect a germline mutation, uh, you should change your screening strategy. So you start younger at 40 years of age or 10 years younger than the younger member of the family had the cancer. Um, and these are the genes that you should be looking at. They're the most important in this situation. For patients with no metastatic prostate cancer and active surveillance, for example, you change the protocol of active surveillance and you, you counsel these patients about treatment. So to bring it all together, elevate the PSA and you're in doubt if you should go ahead and do the biopsy or not. First of all, don't forget the basics. Look at the risk factors that we know, race, the PSA, derivatives, and I put a little highlight on family history on the presence of a BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes because now all these genetic testings are informative in terms of a finding uh, germline mutations in these patients. In terms of the new markers you can use, again, 5 and 4K in the, in the blood, and you have uh, select MDX, EPI in the urine. Um, MRI, I put it here as a biomarker um, because at this point it can also play a role if you find a, a pyrads 3, 4, or 5 lesion, it can be another way for you to lean towards a biopsy in patients that you're in doubt. Once you have the biopsy and you have a cancer diagnosis, you just treat accordingly. If you have high grade pain or atypia, you can use the P10 ERG test to inform the patients who have more aggressive disease. It might need to be rebiopsied immediately, or otherwise you just follow uh, uh, the delay interval biopsy as we usually do. And if they have a negative biopsy, but it's still a, a persistent suspicion for cancer, then uh, you can use the PCA3 in the previous biopsy tissue, the confirming the acts in the previous biopsy tissue. MRI goes up on the scale here, because if you haven't used it before, it's very possible that you missed the cancer on the first biopsy. So now identifying where the lesion is located and targeting, going after this lesion might provide the diagnosis. Uh, and continue to use the blood markers, they've defined 4K uh, uh, longitudinally, so that can continue to inform you the risk if it gets in, get, getting worse or, or better. And if you haven't used the urine tests, like the Select MDX or the EPI, it's a good, it's a good opportunity to do it at this time and then uh, discuss the patients about the risk. So I hope this gives a, a brief overview of what's available and how we try to coordinate and use the rationale to place this test in clinic. I'll be happy to take any questions.